Hello, my friend and friends. Thank you so much for coming to join me for yet another video and for exploring the state of CSS 2023 survey with me, which is what we're going to be doing in this video. Uh, if you're not familiar with the survey, it's a survey that gets an idea of where people's current knowledge of or awareness of and how much they've been using a lot of the newer CSS features is at. And it also goes into your opinions on things like uh, the different frameworks and libraries and authoring solutions we have for CSS today. So we're going to be starting off by going through the parts, the features of CSS itself. And I'm going to be sort of going through and explaining what some of them are as we do this. So maybe before you go ahead and watch me do this, you could answer the survey. And just to take a quick look here, it, here's the page, uh, the state of CSS. So it's the first link that is just down below. And you can dive in and start doing it on your own. Uh, if we come down, you can either have an account or continue as a guest. Uh, I have an account, so I'm going to log in in just a second. But definitely, I'd recommend you do it first. Uh, and then you can, I'm going to go through it myself. I'm assuming I'm familiar with most of the things, though there, we'll see if there's a few that I'm unfamiliar with uh, through here. And for quite a few of them, I'll also take the time to try and do a very quick explanation on what they might be um, sort of as we run through on these. So if you find a few that you're not familiar with as you go through it, hopefully I can help you out. And I'm also going to link to a ton of videos down below uh, on any of the topics that I have covered as well. So let me just log in and I'll see you in one second. All right, so there we go. We can continue on to the survey and I'm gonna go through the parts that aren't opinion-based because there's definitely opinion stuff in here and I don't wanna sway anybody's opinions on things. I'd like you, if you're filling out the survey, and please do go fill it out. It doesn't take long, it's like 10 minutes. I guess if you're watching this, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but even maybe go take it now, see what you know, and then come back later. <laughs> um, and you can maybe get a fill in on some of the things that you didn't know about when you did the survey. Um, and of course it is the first thing that is linked just below this. And so welcome to the survey. Here we go. Here's all the different sections of the survey that are here. We have a new layout now, which is exciting. And I don't think we had code before. So we have some code examples of what things are. And this is something I heard about with the reading list, which is cool because now if you come across something you're not aware of, you can push plus and it adds it to your reading list, um, which is nice. And then uh, I don't know if I can remove it. So we have some in there, but that's that's awesome. We can add stuff in. I'm going to zoom in a little for video sake here. Let's see if we can make that a little bit bigger. Um, and I like having the code blocks because definitely I would see names of stuff here and be like, I think I know that. And then later on, I'd Google it and be like, oh, yeah, I've used that a ton of times. Just the the name here didn't mean anything to me. Um, so, yeah, let's subgrid. If you know me, <laughs> you know I've used it. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I'm going to link to some stuff below and I'll link to my playlist that looks at subgrid. But basically, it lets you have child elements on the parents grid instead of on their own sort of, I don't know how to talk. <laughs> I, I should, it's a hard one to explain with words without examples. So definitely check out those videos if you want to know more about it. And Chrome has announced their intent to ship. So in August, all browsers will finally have subgrid. I'm super excited about that. Um, it looks like we can leave comments as well. So that's kind of, that's another new thing. That's, that's cool. I can leave a comment. I don't know what type of comments I would leave, but um, I won't leave one for there. Writing modes, I've definitely used. Um, Again, it's I'm cheating a little because I do videos about CSS all the time. So hopefully I know um, these logical properties. Uh, block would be instead of the top and bottom. Inline would be instead of left and right. That would also follow uh, your writing mode. So if you changed your writing mode, the logical properties will follow those switches. So the inline start would switch sides if you switched the writing mode from left to right to right to left and all of that. Um, so it sort of replaces using top, bottom, left, and right, or widths and heights as well. You have the um, inline size and the block size. Aspect ratio, I use it. I think that one's pretty straightforward. I'm talking too fast because I'm a little bit out of breath. So we're going to try and slow down a little bit. Uh, content visibility is one I've used. I don't have a video on this though, um, but I've definitely have played around with it a little bit. I've have some content just around this, the whole idea here a little bit, um, but of some of what this could be useful for, but def I, this is one of the ones I, I think when the results come around um, will definitely be high up on there. Flexbox Gap, I've definitely used a lot. <laughs> I started using that before I should have been using it in production. Uh, container queries, I've definitely used one of the things I think most people are excited about the most <laughs> with CSS and will be very happy that we can sort of start playing with those slowly but surely now. Um, though maybe is still a progressive enhancement. It's like a media query, but it's for the size of the parent or the size of the defined container. So you have to say, this is my container. And then the items in there, it's just like a media query, but you're not looking at the whole viewport. You're looking at the contained size that it's inside of. Super useful. Uh, yeah, really good. 
object view box. That one, do I, object view box, object view box inset. Oh, oh, I think I know. Um, I did a article and video for Stephanie Eccles um, series that leads up to Christmas. And I think this is what I talked about, but I think it wasn't a CSS property. It, was it a, was it object view box part of it? I thought it what I looked at, I think was an attribute on an element, but it works exactly to me the way this is working. And maybe it even was this, <laughs> I'm going to put, I know what it is, but I haven't used it because right away looking at it, I know exactly what it's for, but I definitely haven't used it. <laughs> um, I, even in that video, I had to make images of how it worked because there was no browser supporting it at the time. Um, so basically what this is, if you have an image, you can say like, I want to inset the view box, almost like um, the view box on an SVG, but you can do it for an image. So you're sort of like, this is the area I'm looking at, even though I have a bigger image. So you could like highlight a certain part of your image if you wanted to, or something like that. Uh, a little bit like you could play with background sizes and positioning. Um, I wonder what browser support is for that. That one, you know what, we'll add that to my reading list because, oh, and I can take subgrid off. It's behind my head. <laughs> Let's move that out of the way for you. Uh, my reading list is here. I didn't even realize it. So I can take subgrid off. I can leave that on there so I can remember to go and take a look at it after. Cool. Um, dynamic viewports, I definitely have used them. Uh, you, if you've been watching me for a while, you might have seen me use something like DVH, which is the viewport on mobile devices especially can change because if you scroll down and the UI elements move away, like the address bar moves out, the viewport size changes and things like VH always had issues with that. So DVH is the dynamic, so it will adjust whether the UI is visible or not. You also have the S, which is for small, so it just assumes that the UI is always there, or there's the L ones that are the opposite. It means large viewport, so it assumes that the UI is not there. It doesn't assume, it acts as if it isn't visible and this small would act as if it's always visible. So this can fix some of the issues that you can run into on iOS. Um, well, that's where people always complain about it was iOS. So it can fix some of those. The only thing with DVH is it doesn't, it like stays small until you stop scrolling and then it sort of gets bigger after. So it's not like this nice smooth transition the same way the menu disappearing is. So it's not perfect, but it does um, help us with some of the problems we'd have. I've covered this in a video, so I've definitely used the range context. Super nice, super clean. I think it's, you know, I don't think we need to explain it more. Um, it just makes more sense than min width and max width. So that one I like a lot. Anchor positioning. Ooh, new in 2023. Oh, <laughs> that's kind of funny because this one means it's not new. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. <laughs> but uh, anchor positioning, I've read about it. So I'm going to, okay, we're in a funny zone right now. Um, I, I know a hundred percent I've read about it, but I don't remember what it is. So I don't know <laughs> which one to answer here. Um, anchor positioning, anchor name. And looking at that, I have like, it's a slider link. So I'm actually, I'm going to say this cause I completely forget how it worked and what it could do. Like at least the other one, I could explain it to you. This, I have a vague idea of what it is. I've definitely heard about it. Um, but I don't some, add it to my reading list because I guess I have said, this is great for content. I have ideas for content now for videos. It's fantastic. Um, so there we go. Let's go into shapes and graphics and look in here, mix blend modes. I've definitely used. They're super useful. Isolation is also great. It's always, I, I do occasional like underused, um, or underappreciated properties and, and values and CSS stuff. And I always have to remind myself, I've already covered that. I've, I've already covered isolation previously because <laughs> um, I just always want to talk about isolation. It's super like simple. It's one line. Um, it, it works with blend modes, but I don't, well, you could use it for blend modes. It just stops things from blending, but it creates a new stacking context. And that's how I always use it. I'm just like, I need a new stacking context. I'm just using isolation, isolate, but it is part of the blending mode spec, I believe, which is why they would have grouped it here. Filters and effects. I definitely use. Uh, I've been using blur a lot more than I used to actually. Um, there's, there's some good stuff you can do with blur, uh, just in general, it's a, it's a nice property to have. Um, so, you know, instead of box shadows, box shadows are kind of weird because if the parent is transparent or whatever, um, you don't see the area. Does that make sense? Like it doesn't generate a box shadow where the box would have been. So you blur, you can have like a pseudo element that has a solid color blur it anyway. Um, it can be very useful. Backdrop filter, I think a lot of people know it just because it's used for like 
when you're blurring the stuff behind. So that whole glass mor glass morphism thing definitely made every, you know, that was the backdrop filter. It was all about that. The linear easing function. This is really cool. Um, it, it's, it, I've, I've been seeing more people actually, I haven't used it, so I won't say I have, uh, but I've seen a lot with it. It's something that's already in my list for video topic ideas, but I haven't used it yet. So I have no video yet um, ready to go on that, but it's just to make much better easing functions where you can actually, you know, if you, you wanted to bounce before and you'd have to use keyframes, ah, we don't need keyframe animation to do something like that. We can have like our crazy cubic bezier, but for an easing function now um, type of thing. Anyway, I'm not explaining it perfectly well, but definitely look it up. Um, I'm actually going to add it to my reading list to remind myself to look it up in a bit more detail so I can explain it better uh, when it comes to making a video on that. Uh, intrinsic sizing, max content, min content, fit content. I talk a lot about them. Um, the most useful tends to either be max content or more often is fit content. Um, but I've, I've definitely, they're a little bit more fringy. Um, I'll put a link probably to most of these things down. So if you, if there's any of these you want to learn more about is if I have a video on it, it will be down below. Conic, same thing, conic gradients, super useful. If you don't know them, not only, they're really weird at the beginning. They're like these circular gradients, not radial from the center out, but like start here and then like spin around. Um, they look super useless <laughs> when you first see them, but then you can see like they're really good at lots of different use cases um, from crazy patterns to just making really nice gradients and a whole bunch of other stuff in between, including like pie charts. So uh, definitely, yeah, they're super useful. Ah, uh, this is, one of the things I'm most excited about, um, which I haven't been until recently, but seeing, I, I knew it and I'm like, oh, that'd be cool. But basically it's like, if you want to go from your transitioning views, basically, I've seen some really cool examples, uh, using view transitions and you're, you're, as it says, you're going from the old view to the new view <laughs> and, um, that you're having transforms between them. And there's lots of cool demos and other stuff out there. So I definitely would recommend going to check them out. It just looks like it's so easy and it just works. And I'm adding that to my reading list because that's definitely, it's not even in my upcoming videos, but I want to make a video on this. Um, it's one of the things, it just looks so cool and so easy. And it makes a lot of things that previously would have been heavy on JavaScript just work. It's so cool. <laughs> um, and there is also like with that API, I think there's some JavaScript stuff you can do as well. Um, but definitely something I want to read more about and get more into. Colors next, that's exciting. Uh, just because there's lots of new color stuff in CSS. So a lot of these I'm aware of, but I don't, I haven't used them. Um, so for example, I probably, I, I think I actually color itself. I don't think I've used, I probably have used, um, but basically you get to choose what color mode you're using. Um, it's something I definitely need to read more about. So we'll add it to my reading list as well. Um, I've seen a lot of good examples, stuff you can do with it. Our displays have better color. We're not all RGB anymore, sRGB. Uh, we have all these monitors and phone screens that have this huge vivid range of colors that wasn't available in CSS. So now we're actually able to define what color um, mode or whatever uh, it is called that we're gonna be using, which means you can open up this whole new range of colors, which can be useful. Accent color I've definitely used. I have several videos on that one. Um, changes your checkboxes, your radio buttons, your select uh, the, the range sliders uh is it those three maybe there's another one too um you can change the color of them really easily with that so that's super handy here we go these check boxes would be an example these are custom done um but you can custom style them too it's like a very minimal touch that you're doing it's not this big styling you can just change that color um but which is good current color yes <laughs> this is the the og of of custom properties right it's super useful color mix <laughs> Uh, I haven't used it yet. And it, it's one that I actually, this is on my video list. Um, it's not in my calendar yet. It's in like my topic ideas, but this is what I'm really excited about, uh, because it opens up mixing two different colors together, um, which can seem like, why would you want to do that? It's been something that's been in pre-processes for a long time now, uh, but it's coming to CSS, but not only you can choose like what color modes you're mixing them into, which is interesting. Uh, but this is like, if you need to make a shade, you can just go like, oh, I'm adding 20% white to this hex code that I have. And then, so you get something that's like, or a tint, is that a tint? That, that would be a tint. You're adding a little bit white, you can add some black, but you can also mix two colors, just a whole bunch of useful things for this. So um, yeah, super cool. That's coming, or it's sort of here. It's in some browsers. I don't know what the browser support is, but I think it's actually pretty good. Um, what if I haven't used all of them? 
<laughs> I'll, I'll put that I've used these. Um, I have a lot of content that I want to make on colors because there's so much new good stuff coming. Um, LCH is the one that I kept hearing is like it's more human understandable than um, the one we use now. HSL. Took me a second there. <laughs> um, then HSL. Because the problem with HSL is like you could take two colors that are at the same lightness value and one of them is super bright and the other one is actually pretty dark and it's just because of how our eyes perceive color. Whereas LCH, it, it handles that in a much better way. So if colors have the lightness is the first value, so if you're keeping the lightness the same, they're much more, the perceived value of that lightness is much closer matched. For me, I've had so much trouble playing with it just because lightness is first instead of the last value and then it's chroma and hue. My, my brain just hasn't like absorbed the mental way of working with it yet because I haven't used it enough. But definitely um, as browser support increases, for me, I think LCH will replace my HSL. Um, but there's other reasons. There's also the OK ones and I, I, something I also need to research a little bit more, but I have played around with them. Relative colors, I know what it is as well, but I haven't done anything with them where it's kind of cool because you can say I have this color and then even though this is a hex color, I can say I want the HSL value. Like I'm going to, I'm going to transform that using HSL. So it's going to break it down into HSL effectively. So I'm saying this it was my color is this one. My hue is going to stay the same. My saturation is going to stay the same, but I'm going to do a calc on the lightness and multiply it by 1.2, or I could do a, a change my hue. So same thing. I could change my hue by like times 1.1 or whatever. And so you can make like shade, like play around with your hues or your saturations or your, and of course this is doing it, you know, we can go back here and do it with LCH instead, or one of the other newer color models and everything. Um, so yeah, really. One of those things that I'm like, that's really cool that we can do that with. And I'm just looking forward to seeing, and I'm sure there's already demos out there of the like awesome stuff you can actually do with it from people smarter than me uh, that, that come up with all the creative ways to use it. Um, but yeah, that one's a good one. Interpolation color spaces. Oh yeah, okay. So I, again, I haven't used this, but you're just saying I'm doing a linear gradient. That's this HA cell value, it's going to red. But because gradients, if you do it in different color spaces, they actually um, like a gradient again, because of how the color values work and everything and how the color space works for going in between values and how the math works. And it's all the stuff with colors that's weird, but like the same gradient in five different color spaces will look completely different in each one. The middle ranges, the two ends should be the same more or less, but the middle values, like some will get washed out to white. Some will go to like a muddy brown depending on the colors used as well. Um, so here we can say, well, this is, I have an HSL value and red or like a hex code here. I want to make a gradient between those. And that gradient should be using the OK Lab to do the calculation on how to do it. So it's as if it's going to treat these as OK Lab and do the whole gradient using that. At least that's my understanding of it. Uh, any of these ones that I haven't used, take them with a grain of salt. But that's what my understanding of it is. Um, but if there's, if I'm wrong on any of this stuff, please let me know in the comments, uh, or if there's some that I haven't got right, just let me know, um, whatever it is, corrections, clarifications, anything. Um, yeah, put those in the comments below. Scroll snap, I've definitely used and played with it's snap helps with scroll snapping, <laughs> right? So if you go to scroll, it would like stop at a very specific place. Um, I did a video on the Netflix style thing using that and some stuff with Adam Argyle too, and probably some other stuff, um, over scroll behavior, you know, when you're scrolling and you have like, say a, a window that has not a window, like a div, let's, as an example that can scroll, if you have an overflow with a scroll on it, if you get to the bottom of that and you keep scrolling, I'm doing this like it's a touch device, but you, you say you have your mouse wheel in there and you get to the end, the default behavior, once it gets to the end, if you're scrolling, we'll start scrolling like the parent, which is or the next scroll bar, which is usually the like the browser window. And often you don't want that to happen. So when you're scrolling in that like limited view box or, you know, the small div or whatever, and you get to the bottom of that and you keep scrolling, it goes to the next out scroll bar. will just start scrolling. So that's usually your viewport. So then your whole window starts to scroll. And so you can use over scroll behavior and contain it. So when you're scrolling, and you know, it gets to the bottom of that, as long as the mouse is on top of that or whatever your pointer device is on top of that element, it won't scroll the viewport. You're, you're limiting over scroll behavior basically. So, uh, yeah, that's a useful one that probably isn't used enough. Um, touch actions is dealing with, <laughs> with touch actions. I think it's pretty straightforward. Scroll behavior, smooth and auto, uh, 
you know, if you have anchor links on a page and you click, it either jumps or it scrolls there. Um, definitely, I've done videos on that one. I haven't done a video actually on um, touch action. I probably should. Um, scroll bar gutter. Uh, this is one I haven't done a vid. Did I do a video on it? I'm not even sure. But uh, I remember being really excited about this and then not as happy um, as recently. Actually, I think Kyle recently did a short on this. But basically what it is, is do you want the browser to account for the space that the scroll bar would take up if one is visible, even if there isn't one? And so that could just mean like you're preventing jumps in content or if you have multiple things that have scrollers on them, that there's consistency between them uh, with their spacing and everything. Um, so yeah, that can be, it can be kind of useful, um, but it just... If you have backgrounds and stuff, it doesn't go into the space or I think, I don't remember exactly. I just remember being like, oh, it's really cool. Oh, there's some limitations that make it so it doesn't quite work the way I was hoping it would work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely still something you could definitely use. It just wasn't as amazing as I was hoping it would be. Um, font display here with font, oh, we're into typography now. So font face stuff and then you have the font display fallback. I have a video that talks a bit about that. I think, did I not? Maybe I didn't do one on font display. I think I included font display when I talked about uh, font face though, but it's possible I didn't. I have to think about that a little bit. Um, line clamp, <laughs> I did do a video on that one. This is the annoying one. And actually the spec now is for, this is like how we need to make it work now. Basically it's if you have like, say you have a card and you want to show, you're bringing in dynamic content to your card and you only want to show two lines and then there's like an ellipsis after and you know maybe on some cards there is only two lines and other there's 10 that actually come in but you want to crop it and include the ellipsis but not like one line you want to make sure it's after two lines or after three lines of text only um, there is a line clamp property that is part of the spec that nobody currently supports but all the browsers support this version <laughs> so you have to do these four lines of code to what will eventually hopefully <laughs> eventually be one um, but yeah, it could be useful. Variable fonts, I've done a video on them. They're great. Um, you need one font, you get different weights, different variables as the name implies. So you can have like your italics, you can have crazy weird stuff. You can, there's lots of really cool stuff with it um, and ranges of weights. And you can have like a 206 roll, even here, 375 for the weight um, and other stuff. So definitely um, super useful, super cool. Uh, font palette. Uh, I've played with it. It's really cool. Um, but you need to find a font that has like a color font and there is a Google fonts has started adding more, but just in general, there's a very limited amount of good color fonts out there. Um, and the font palette is what you would use to control the colors. So the colored font might, you may be going, I can set a color on any font, but a, a colored font will have multiple colors within the font itself. So maybe it looks bezeled or maybe there's like weird, it, it's for more fun <laughs> display type fonts. Um, usually, and then so you can set each individual color using the override colors here. Um, and yeah, you define your font palette and then how you want to set it up with those override colors, and then you just use it wherever you want. Um, so you can have like 10 different palettes that you're choosing in between, depending on circumstances. Maybe you just have one palette, whatever it is. Um, again, what's well, more definitely a much more niche thing, but could be super useful in the right situation just did videos on this. <laughs> I did a short and a video. Um, so you're just balancing out text. Um, it only works on text. I think it's maximum of four lines. Maybe it's even three. I think it's four though. Um, and mostly to me, this is useful for headlines. So just, there's no examples on here. Um, but if you have like text that's going and then one word sitting at the end and you just want that to be a bit more balanced out, text wrap balance works. It's pretty cool. Browser support's not great, but um, that's fine prefers reduced motion. I've used it, um, have videos on it, or at least where I use them. I don't think I've done a video dedicated to prefers reduced motion though. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it, does the person prefer or not, you know, do they prefer reduced motion in their system settings? If not, you can reduce the animations. Uh, it is prefers reduced motion, not no motion. So it doesn't mean that you have to get rid of every single transition and animation. It just means that ideally, uh, there's less of them and ideally you're also doing it. You don't have to, but the easy, well, the easier way, it's a little bit like mobile first where you use your me media query to add in complexity. You can do the same thing with prefers reduced motion. So you prefers reduced motion, no preference. And then you're add in your animations, transitions that could be problematic for people that would prefer not to see them for a variety of different reasons. I use this a lot Prefers color scheme, uh, dark, you can set up your dark mode 
Spurs reduced data. Um, I haven't talked about it a lot, but it's nice and easy. So maybe you have a font that's loading in, but if somebody's on their phone that's on like a reduced data mode, then and as long as the phone uh, or the device that the person's on is saying they're on reduced data mode, I think even on laptops, you can set them up. Um, so you're on like a metered connection and stuff. It is the device that decides when this would be kicking in as far as I understand. Maybe there's browser settings now, I'm not sure. Um, but you could, instead of loading in the heavy font that you're using, you could just change your font family to system UI. Um, and there's some other stuff that you could do, you know, maybe you're setting background colors instead of background images, um, and other stuff. So it's a, a good one uh, to be able to use color scheme. Uh, this is like your default to dark mode. I use it a lot, so I won't talk about it too much, but color scheme light dark just means I have a light and dark color scheme that I want to use and so pick based on the user's system preference and it's going to set the user agent styles to either a light or dark based on the user's preference. Um, so if you are going to do a dark mode it just sort of puts the user agent styles in the dark mode which can be useful. You can also omit light and just say dark if you're only doing a dark theme light um, and again just to sort of set the stage in the right direction. Prefers contrast is a um, you know it's, these are all like accessibility related ones as as the page here that we're on uh, sort of um, indicates. So if the user has indicated in their system preferences that they prefer high contrast, you can have a higher contrast style, just like you could have a dark style, a dark theme. Um, forest colors I have talked about in videos. Forest colors is instead of being a high contrast site like here where the user is requesting high contrast, Force colors is when in the system settings and windows anyway, there's a way of setting like this high contrast mode, like super high contrast mode um, that completely takes away a lot of colors and actually a border of two pixels green solid, the green wouldn't even work. Um, it, it the col Your color choices go out the window. And there's a very limited set of values you can actually use for colors. Um, pretty sure anyway that you can't specify green I could be wrong though on that. I, I, if again, once again, correct, correct me if, in the comments if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure green there wouldn't work. Um, you can use, the, again, there's like maybe you can use your canvas color, your the base text color, an outline color maybe, um, or interact. I don't know. There's like, there's a set limited color. And then depending on the theme the person's picked, it's going to use one of those colors. Um, and I don't think you can specify specific ones, but I could be a little bit wrong there. Uh, focus visible is handy. This is sort of the new default in browsers now. Um, so when you focus with like keyboard focus, but you also gain focus on stuff. Like when I click on these, they're gaining focus, but see how when I click and then I leave, like, um, this doesn't stay highlighted. Let's say I tab through here. I'm actually curious. Okay. So if I tab on that, there's like a lighter, see that color that's like on there. Um, and if I use my arrows, I can move it. But see how it's like, there's like two rings. And if I tab off, that outside ring goes away. And if I click on it, it's also doing that. So it's not using focus visible. This is using focus. If it was focus visible, which is really good on bu buttons, because when you click on a button um, that you don't want to go somewhere, but like it would gain that focus ring, which is kind of annoying because you're, you know, you just don't want it to be the focus ring. But if they're tabbed onto it, it makes sense to have it. Um, so it, it just depends on how the person's interacting with it. The browser decides wh which one is appropriate to show when. Um, yeah. On a lot of things, focus visible makes a lot of sense, which is why on I think most stuff it's the browser default now. Variables, you know that I've used variables. I have mini series on them. I've been talking about them for years. Uh, so you know, custom properties or CSS variables right there. At supports, it's a way to check for support. <laughs> you probably wouldn't be looking for table cell and display list item, um, but if you want to use a newer feature, you can do an at supports, and if the browser supports the feature that you're looking at. Uh, then you can write specific code and outside it. So you could do like a certain layout and then have if supports and have like a media query type thing in here. So like um, container or name or whatever it is, and then do your container query in there. So the other browsers are using the other one. And then if it does support container queries, it would use your container query layout instead um, type of thing. Comparison functions, use them all the time. Um, and I, I still get comments about this in my videos. If you're using a min, max, or clamp, you do not need to use a calc inside of those. So you can do like a 50 VW plus two rem, it's going to work or times whatever math works inside of these without having to use a calc. So little tip there. Uh, at property, I've used it, played with it, looking forward to browser support getting better because it's really cool. <laughs> um, it lets you, uh, I'm going to, 
like declare a, a custom or register a custom property but with a bit more information because custom properties can be anything whatsoever and now we're not getting anything whatsoever we're getting like uh, we're telling it is it a color is it a number is it a string what is it and that can be really useful because some of these things can be animated and it can let you animate your custom properties. So you can have a gradient that's animated because you're not animating the background image, you're animating the custom property values only. Um, and it opens up some really cool doors. That's like a really basic look at it, but it opens up some really awesome doors. Um, and yeah, once browser support hits for that, it's gonna be great. And it is supported in Safari now. It's only Firefox that it isn't. As far as I know, maybe, I don't know. I should look. <laughs> I haven't looked into that in a while. Uh, marker, I've used it. You can change your bullet points to whatever the marker is. If you have list items, um, you can also change the color. So that could be good if you just want to change the color of like the numbered list, but not the like the actual content, just the one, two, three, four, but the, the rest of the text stays the other color. Um, it's very limited what you can style on that though. Has just like container queries much earlier on, super, super excited for. Um, I've done videos on it. There's lots of cool content. It's a complete game changer uh, and opens up things that were impossible to do before, where we can say the parent is styled based on what the children are. So it's basically a parent selector. Super cool. Uh, where it's just like is, but there's no specificity in it. Super useful. And actually I would skip over this, but on my is and where video, a lot of people say that is, and by contrast, where is basically the same as using the ampersand in um, SCSS or so just like that type of thing within um, preprocessors. And it's not the same. Um, if you do it the other way around than what we're doing here, it would be. So say I did P and then like the, like I'm looking for, I don't know, paragraphs, headings, and other things that are all inside my header. You could probably use your ampersand in that sort of way. Doing this way around, I, or maybe I'm just missing it, and I'm like, I don't see how you do this with an ampersand. Uh, and of course, this is different because it's where, so there's no specificity on this part of the selector. Um, but yeah, I just it, you can do a lot more with is and with where than you would be able to with a with an ampersand. Um, it, it's not like nesting, and nesting's coming to CSS. We'll probably have something coming up soon. I'm guessing. There it is. I see it. <laughs> um, Nesting is very different from using is and where, and you can do more stuff with this, and you can use nesting with these, um, so they're, they're not quite the same. Cascade layers, um, I haven't gotten like full in on using them. I just haven't had the need, but um, there you can organize things by specificity. I could definitely see their usefulness. Um, I'm curious, if you use cascade layers like in production or in like, personal projects and stuff, please leave a comment down below and let me know about that too. Shadow Dom is a place I'm not super familiar with, <laughs> um, but I have uh, I did a video with uh, Dave Rupert where we did take a look at them and I played around with it a bit after, so I have used them, um, but I'm like super new, but I'm not going to try and explain them. <laughs> uh, but I have used them, so I get a, I get that there. Uh, trigon trigonomic functions <laughs> again, I've used them. I did a video on them to sort of show them a lot of smarter people who know why these would be useful <laughs> uh, can can talk a lot more about them but basically we have trigonomic functions in css now and they can be useful um, especially if you need to make a circle of elements and <laughs> i don't know what else you'd use it for that's what i did in my video <laughs> um, and it seems like the easiest thing to get but anyway i'm sure there's other stuff um, i don't know if i can say i use this or not because i haven't I, i'm going to say no because i haven't used it in vanilla css yet um, but I've definitely, I know what it is. I've used it in SAS for years, um, but I haven't used it in vanilla. Um, I, I did play with it also with post CSS, but again, it's a post processor. So like I haven't used it in a browser supporting it yet, even though Chrome supports it now, question mark. Um, so definitely, and I, actually I think it's Chrome and Safari support it. So a video will be coming on nesting soon. Uh, image set. Um, this is sort of like your source set for background Im uh, for actual images, but it's coming to CSS. So you can, you know, if you have different sized images based on like how, you know, the media queries and other stuff, how big is the screen, what's the resolution, the browser will pick the appropriate one on its own. Um, so you're not loading in like this massive image that doesn't have to be loaded in. Um, <laughs> I meant to do a video on it, but the browser support was terrible, but I played around with it a lot. I don't know if the browser support is increased and I should, I'm going to add that to my reading list just because if it, I, I want to look into if browser supports better now, because I'll do a video on it if it actually is better. 
this is what I was thinking of before. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to put I used it because I wrote an article on this. The thing at the, the beginning, the view box, this is what I was talking about. This is the X, Y, W, H is defining the view box. I knew there was something similar. <laughs> that, <laughs> um, so yeah, this one, uh, again, I don't think it's supported by any browsers yet. Uh, I could be wrong, um, but basically you can say your image. It's the image function instead of the URL function for background images. It all just came flooding back to me. And that's why the other one looked for unfamiliar, but was a familiar concept. Um, and there's more you can do with this. Look for my video. Again, I'll link it down below, but at the time, no browser supported it. Um, but basically it opens up a whole bunch of cool stuff we can do with background images um, using the image function instead of using the URL function. Individual transform properties I have used. I've talked about them. I recently put a quiz out and in the quiz people, I said, which one of these is not a valid property? And the other one I included was skew because skew is a value that we can use if we do a transform just like translate, rotate, and scale, but only translate, rotate, and scale are now their own properties. And a few people replied to that quiz saying that they're properties, but they're not. They're values or value functions really, but they're values we can use for transform. And then they decided to take these three and also make them their own properties. I've also talked about Amit Sheen, who does a ton of stuff with animations and 3D stuff and all of that. And he still recommends just avoiding these. Um, I am lazy sometimes, so I, I use these because it's a little faster. Uh, and an interesting thing in that CSS challenge we did, I did a while back from Amit is I found out you could tra transform, rotate something and rotate, function it and have both of them being applied, which was an interesting way to solve uh, a, a animation challenge thing, um, which was kind of cool. <laughs> Not something you'd probably want to do in production, but um, it was pretty cool. Um, so this is where I'm going to stop because now we're getting into the world of CSS frameworks, CSS and JS, other tools, CSS usage, etc. Uh, and I don't want to give away my opinions on any of this stuff because I think it would actually influence you guys in your own answers for some of these and maybe not, hopefully not. But um, I think it's possible that if I talk very highly about something or very badly about something, you'd be like, oh, I went from I would think about using that to I'm not going to use it now. And I don't want to influence anyone's opinions on any of the stuff that is in here. So I'm going to continue this survey on my own, but I would really encourage you if you didn't do it ahead of me to go through and answer it now. Uh, if, if you hadn't heard of things before I talked about them during that entire section, uh, be honest about like your knowledge of it beforehand, you know, because maybe now you know of something you didn't know about before. <laughs> so don't use this video as your I know of. So go ahead and take the survey. The more people who answer this, the better, the bigger the sample is, the more representative of it is of our, you know, our world in general. So yeah, please go and take the survey. It's not run by me. I'm not affiliated with it in any way. It's Sasha who puts in all the hard work and he has a other team of people who put in a lot of hard work. Uh, to put this whole site together for this and the CSS, uh, the JS survey as well. And by taking it, you know, it, it, it's just good to know where everyone's at. It can let the browsers know what features people are interested in um, and, and what direction things should be going. Because as I said, some of these I don't think are even supported currently by browsers. Uh, you can leave comments, leave other stuff along the way uh, in these as well about your opinions on, on different things. Um, so yeah, go ahead and fill that out. And once the results are in, we'll take a look at those together as well. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your report on the internet just a little bit more awesome.